Section 25 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5 by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 25. The Rector of Weiby by Steen Steens and Blicher, Part One. Extracts from the diary of Erik Sorensen, District Judge, followed by two written statements by the Rector of Alsö, give a complete picture of the terrible events that took place in the parish of Weiby during Judge Sorensen's first year of office. Should any one be inclined to doubt the authenticity of these documents? let him at least have no doubt about the story which is alas only too sadly true the memory of these events is still fresh in the district and the events themselves have been the direct cause of a change in the method of criminal trials a suspected murderer is now tried through all the courts before his conviction can be determined readers versed in the history of law will doubtless know by this during what epoch the story is laid. 1. From the diary of District Judge Erik Sorensen. Now am I unworthy one, by the grace of God, may judge over this district. May the great judge above give me wisdom and uprightness, that I may fulfill my difficult task in all humility. From the Lord alone cometh judgment. It is not good that man should live alone. Now that I am able to support a wife, I will look about me for a helpmeet. I hear much good said about the daughter of the rector of Weiby. Since her mother's death, she has been a wise and economical keeper of her father's house. And as she and her brother, the student, are the only children, she will inherit a tidy sum when the old man dies. Morten Bruce of Ingvorstrup was here to-day, and wanted to make me present of a fat calf, but I answered him in the words of Moses, Cursed be he who taketh gifts. He is of a very quarrelsome nature, a sharp bargainer, and a boastful talker. I do not want to have any dealings with him, except through my office as judge. I have prayed to God for wisdom, and I have consulted with my own heart and I believe that Mistress Metequist is the only woman with whom I could live and die. But I will watch her for a time in secret. Beauty is deceptive, and charm is a dangerous thing. But I must say that she is the most beautiful woman I have yet seen. I think that Morton Bruce is a very disagreeable person. I scarcely know why myself. But whenever I see him something comes over me something that is like the memory of an evil dream and yet it is so vague and so faint that i could not say whether i had really ever seen the man in my dreams or not it may be a sort of presentiment of evil who knows he was here again and offered me a pair of horses beautiful animals at a ridiculously low price it looked queer to me i know that he paid seventy thalers for them and he wanted to let me have them for the same price. They are at least worth one hundred thalers, if not more. Was it intended for a bribe? He may have another lawsuit pending. I do not want his horses. I paid a visit to the rector of Weiby today. He is a fine, God-fearing man, but somewhat quick-tempered and dictatorial and he is close with his money, too, as I could see. Just as I arrived, a peasant was with him, trying to be let off the payment of part of his tithe. The man is surely a rogue, for the sum is not large. But the rector talked to him as I wouldn't have talked to a dog, and the more he talked, the more violent he became. Well, we all have our faults. The rector meant well in spite of his violence, for later on he told his daughter to give the man a sandwich and a good glass of beer. 
she is certainly a charming and sensible girl she greeted me in a modest and friendly manner and my heart beat so that i could scarcely say a word in reply my head farmhand served in the rectory three years i will question him one often hears a straight and true statement from servants a surprise my farmhand rasmus tells me that morton bruce came a wooing to the rectory at veby some years back but was sent away with a refusal the rector seemed to be pleased with him for the man is rich but his daughter would not hear to it at all pastor Søren may have tried hard to persuade her to consent at first but when he saw how much she disliked the man he let her do as she would it was not pride on her part rasmus said for she is as simple and modest as she is good and beautiful and she knows that her own father is peasant-born as well as bruce now i know what the ingorstrup horses were intended for they were to blind the judge and to lead him aside from the narrow path of righteousness the rich morton bruce covets poor ole anderson's peat moor and pasture land it would have been a good bargain for morton even at seventy thalers but no indeed my good fellow you don't know erik sorensen rector soren quist of Veby came to see me this morning he has a new coachman niels bruce brother to the owner of ingvorstrup niels is lazy and impertinent the rector wanted him arrested but he had no witnesses to back up his complaint i advised him to get rid of the man somehow or else to get along with him the best he could until the latter's time was up the rector was somewhat hasty at first but later on he listened calmly and thanked me for my good advice he is inclined to be violent at times but can always be brought to listen to reason we parted good friends i spent a charming day in Weybe yesterday the rector was not at home but mistress mette received me with great friendliness she sat by the door spinning when i arrived and it seemed to me that she blushed it was hardly polite for me to wait so long before speaking when i sit in judgment i never lack for words but in the presence of this innocent maiden i am as stupid as the veriest simpleton of a chicken thief but i finally found my voice and the time passed quickly until the rector's return then mistress mette left us and did not return until she brought in our supper just as she stepped through the doorway the rector was saying to me isn't it about time that you should think of entering into the holy state of matrimony we had just been speaking of a recent very fine wedding in the neighborhood mistress mette heard the words and flushed a deep red her father laughed and said to her i can see my dear daughter that you have been standing before the fire i shall take the good man's advice and will very soon try my fate with her for i think i may take her rector's words to be a secret hint that he would not object to me as a son-in-law and the daughter was her blush a favorable sign poor ole anderson keeps his peat moor and his pasture land but rich morton bruce is angry at me because of it when he heard the decision he closed his eyes and set his lips tight and his face was as pale as a whitewashed wall but he controlled himself and as he went out he called back to his adversary wish you joy of the bargain ole anderson the peat bog won't beggar me and the cattle at ingvorstrup have all the hay they can eat i could hear his loud laughter outside and the cracking of his whip it is not easy to have to sit in judgment every decision makes but one enemy the more yesterday was the happiest day of my life we celebrated our betrothal in the rectory of Veby. my future father-in-law spoke to the text I gave my handmaid into thy bosom. Genesis 16, verse 5. His words touched my heart. I had not believed that this serious and sometimes brusque man could talk so sweetly. 
when the solemnity was over i received the first kiss from my sweet betrothed and the assurance of her great love for me at supper and later on we were very merry many of the dead mother's kin were present the rector's family were too far away after supper we danced until daybreak and there was no expense spared in the food and wine my future father-in-law was the strongest man present and could easily drink all the others under the table the wedding is to take place in six weeks god grant us rich blessings it is not good that my future father-in-law should have this niels bruce in his service he is a defiant fellow a worthy brother of him of ingvorstrup if it were i he should have his wages and be turned off the sooner the better but the good rector is stubborn and insists that niels shall serve out his time the other day he gave the fellow a box on the ear at which niels cried out that he would make him pay for it the rector told me of this himself for no one else had been present i talked to niels but he would scarcely answer me i fear he has a stubborn and evil nature my sweet betrothed also entreats her father to send the fellow away but the rector will not listen to reason i do not know what the old man will do when his daughter leaves his home for mine she saves him much worry and knows how to make all things smooth and easy she will be a sweet wife for me as i thought it turned out badly but there is one good thing about it niels has now run off of himself the rector is greatly angered but i rejoice in secret that he is rid of that dangerous man bruce will probably seek retaliation but we have law and justice in the land to order such matters this was the way of it the rector had ordered niels to dig up a bit of soil in the garden after a time when he went out himself to look at the work he found niels leaning on his spade eating nuts he had not even begun to dig the rector scolded him but the fellow answered that he had not taken service as a gardener he received a good box on the ear for that at this he threw away his spade and swore valiantly at his master the old rector lost his temper entirely seized the spade and struck at the man several times he should not have done this for a spade is a dangerous weapon especially in the hands of a man as strong as is the pastor in spite of his years niels fell to the ground as if dead but when the pastor bent over him in alarm he sprang up suddenly jumped the hedge and ran away to the woods this is the story of the unfortunate affair as my father-in-law tells it to me my beloved met is much worried about it she fears the man may do harm to the cattle or set fire to the house or in some such way take his revenge but i tell her there is little fear of that three weeks more and my beloved leaves her father's house for mine she has been here and has gone over the house and the farm she is much pleased with everything and praises our orderliness she is an angel and all who know her say that i am indeed a fortunate man to god be the praise strange where that fellow niels went to could he have left the country altogether it is an unpleasant affair in any case and there are murmurings and secret gossip among the peasants the talk has doubtless started in ingvorstrup it would not be well to have the rector hear it he had better have taken my advice but it is not my province to school a servant of god and a man so much older than i the idle gossip may blow over ere long i will go to baby to-morrow and find out if he has heard anything the bracelet the goldsmith has made for me is very beautiful i am sure it will please my sweet mette my honoured father-in-law is much distressed and downhearted malicious tongues have repeated to him the stupid gossip that is going about in the district morton bruce is reported to have said that he would force the rector to bring back his brother if he had to dig him out of the earth 
the fellow may be in hiding somewhere possibly at ingvorstrup he has certainly disappeared completely and no one seems to know where he is my poor betrothed is much grieved and worried she is alarmed by bad dreams and by presentiments of evil to come god have mercy on us all i am so overcome by shock and horror that i can scarcely hold the pen it has all come in one terrible moment like a clap of thunder i take no account of time night and morning are the same to me and the day is but a sudden flash of lightning destroying the proud castle of my hopes and desires a venerable man of god the father of my betrothed is in prison and as a suspected murderer there is still hope that he may be innocent but this hope is but as a straw to a drowning man a terrible suspicion rests upon him and i unhappy man that i am must be his judge and his daughter is my betrothed bride may the saviour have pity on us it was yesterday that this horrible thing came about half an hour before sunrise morten bruce came to my house and had with him the cotter jens larsen of veby and the widow and daughter of the shepherd of that parish morten bruce said to me that he had the rector of veby under suspicion of having killed his brother niels i answered that i had heard some such talk but had regarded it as idle and malicious gossip for the rector himself had assured me that the fellow had run away if that was so said morten if niels had really intended to run away he would surely at first come to me to tell me of it but it is not so as these good people can prove to you and i demand that you shall hear them as an officer of the law think well of what you are doing i said think it over well morten bruce and you my good people you are bringing a terrible accusation against a respected and unspotted priest and man of god if you can prove nothing as i strongly suspect your accusations may cost you dear priest or no priest cried bruce it is written thou shalt not kill and also is it written that the authorities bear the sword of justice for all men we have law and order in the land and the murderer shall not escape his punishment even if he have the district judge for a son-in-law i pretended not to notice his thrust and began i shall be as you say kirsten mudd's daughter what is it that you know of this matter in which morten bruce accuses your rector tell the truth and the truth only as you would tell it before the judgment seat of the almighty the law will demand from you that you shall later repeat your testimony under oath the woman told the following story the day on which niels bruce was said to have run away from the rectory she and her daughter were passing along the road near the rectory garden a little after the noon hour she heard someone calling and saw that it was niels bruce looking out through the garden hedge he asked the daughter if she did not want some nuts and told the women that the rector had ordered him to dig in the garden but that he did not take the command very seriously and would much rather eat nuts at that moment they heard a door open in the house and niels said no i mean for a scolding he dropped back behind the hedge and the women heard a quarrel in the garden they could hear the words distinctly but they could see nothing as the hedge was too high they heard the rector cry i'll punish you you dog i'll strike you dead at my feet then they heard several sounding slaps and they heard niels curse back at the rector and call him evil names the rector did not answer this but the women heard two dull blows and saw the head of a spade and part of the handle rise and fall twice over the hedge then it was very quiet in the garden and the widow and her daughter were frightened and hurried on to their cattle in the field the daughter gave the same testimony word for word i asked them if they had not seen niels bruce coming out of the garden but they said they had not although they had turned back several times to look 
This accorded perfectly with what the rector had told me. It was not strange that the women had not seen the man run out of the garden, for he had gone towards the wood which is on the opposite side of the garden from the high road. I told Morton Bruce that this testimony was no proof of the supposed murder, especially as the rector himself had narrated the entire occurrence to me exactly as the women had described it. But he smiled bitterly and asked me to examine the third witness, which I proceeded to do. Jens Larsen testified that he was returning late one evening from Tolstrup, as he remembered it was not the evening of Nils Bruce's disappearance, but the evening of the following day, and was passing the rectory garden on the easterly side by the usual footpath. From the garden he heard a noise as of someone digging in the earth. He was frightened at first, for it was very late, but the moon shone brightly, and he thought he would see who it was that was at work in the garden at that hour. He put off his wooden shoes and pushed aside the twigs of the hedge until he had made a peephole. In the garden he saw the rector in his usual housecoat, a white woolen nightcap on his head. He was busily smoothing down the earth with the flat of his spade. There was nothing else to be seen. Just then the rector had started and partly turned toward the hedge, and the witness, fearing he might be discovered, slipped down and ran home hastily. Although I was rather surprised that the rector should be working in his garden at so late an hour, I still saw nothing in this statement that could arouse suspicion of murder. I gave the complainant a solemn warning, and advised him not only to let fall his accusation, but to put an end to the talk in the parish. He replied, not until i see what it is that the rector buried in his garden that will be too late i said you are playing a dangerous game dangerous to your own honour and welfare i owe it to my brother he replied and i demand that the authorities shall not refuse me assistance my office compelled me to accede to his demands accompanied by the accuser and his witnesses i took my way to Veby. My heart was very heavy, not so much because of any fear that we might find the missing man buried in the garden, but because of the surprise and distress I must cause the rector and my beloved. As we went on our way, I thought over how severely the law would allow me to punish the calumniators. But, alas, merciful heavens! What a terrible discovery was in store for me! I had wished to have a moment alone with the rector to prepare him for what was coming. But as I drove through the gate, Morton Bruce spurred his horse past me and galloped up to the very door of the house just as the rector opened it. Bruce cried out in his very face, people say that you have killed my brother and buried him in your garden i am come with the district judge to seek for him the poor rector was so shocked and astounded that he could not find a word to answer i sprang from my wagon and addressed him you have now heard the accusation i am forced by my office to fulfil this man's demands but your own honour demands that the truth shall be known and the mouth of slander silenced. It is hard enough, began the rector finally, for a man in my position to have to clear himself from such a suspicion. But come with me. My garden and my entire house are open to you. We went through the house to the garden. On the way we met my betrothed, who was startled at seeing Bruce. I managed to whisper hastily to her, Do not be alarmed, dear heart. Your enemies are going to their own destruction. Morton Bruce led the way to the eastern side of the garden, near the hedge. We others followed with the rector's farmhands, whom he himself had ordered to join us with spades. The accuser stood and looked about him until we approached. Then he pointed to one spot. This looks as if the earth had been disturbed lately. Let us begin here. Go to work at once, commanded the rector angrily. The men set to work, 
but they were not eager enough to suit Bruce, who seized a spade himself to fire them on. A few strokes only sufficed to show that the firm earth of this particular spot had not been touched for many years. We all rejoiced except Bruce, and the rector was very happy. He triumphed openly over his accuser and laughed at him. "'Can't you find anything you libel her?' Bruce did not answer. He pondered for a few moments, then called out, "'Jens Larsen, where was it you saw the rector digging?' Jens Larsen had been standing to one side with his hands folded, watching the work. At Bruce's words he aroused himself as if from a dream, looked about him, and pointed to a corner of the garden, several yards from where we stood. "'I think it was over there.' "'What's that, Jens?' cried the rector angrily. "'When did I dig here?' Paying no heed to this, Morton Bruce called the men to the corner in question. The earth here was covered by some withered cabbage stalks, broken twigs and other brush, which he pushed aside hurriedly. The work began anew. I stood by the rector, talking calmly with him about the punishment we could mete out to the distardly accuser, when one of the men suddenly cried out with an oath. We looked toward them. There lay a hat half buried in the loose earth. "'We have found him!' cried Bruce. "'That is Neil's hat. I would know it anywhere.' My blood seemed turned to ice. All my hopes dashed to the ground. "'Dig, dig!' cried the bloodthirsty accuser, working himself with all his might. I looked at the rector. He was ghastly pale, staring with wide open eyes at the horrible spot. Another shout. A hand was stretched up through the earth, as if to greet the workers. "'See there!' screamed Bruce. He is holding out his hand to me. Wait a little, Brother Niels, you will soon be avenged. The entire corpse was soon uncovered. It was the missing man. His face was not recognizable, as decomposition had begun, and the nose was broken and laid flat by a blow. But all the garments, even to the shirt with his name woven into it, were known to those who stood there. In one ear was a leaden ring, which, as we all knew, Niels Bruce had worn for many years. "'Now, priest,' cried Morton Bruce, "'come and lay your hand on this dead man if you dare to.' "'Almighty God!' signed the rector, looking up to heaven. "'Thou art my witness that I am innocent. I struck him, that I confess, and I am bitterly sorry for it. But he ran away. God Almighty alone knows who buried him here. Jens Larsen knows also, cried Bruce, and I may find more witnesses, Judge. You will come with me to examine his servants, but first of all I demand that you shall arrest this wolf in sheep's clothing. Merciful God, how could I doubt any longer? The truth was clear to all of us but I was ready to sink into the earth in my shock and horror. I was about to say to the rector that he must prepare to follow me, when he himself spoke to me, pale and trembling, like an aspen leaf. "'Appearances are against me,' he said, "'but this is the work of the devil and his angels. There is one above who will bring my innocence to light. Come, judge, I will await my fate in fetters.' Comfort my daughter. Remember that she is your betrothed bride. He had scarcely uttered the words when I heard a scream and a fall behind us. It was my beloved who lay unconscious on the ground. I thought at first that she was dead. And God knows I wished that I could lie there, dead beside her. I raised her in my arms, but her father took her from me and carried her into the house. I was called to examine the wound on the dead man's head. The cut was not deep, but it had evidently fractured the skull, and had plainly been made by a blow from a spade, or some similar blunt instrument. Then we all entered the house. My beloved had revived again. 
she fell on my neck and implored me in the name of god to help her father in his terrible need she begged me by the memory of our mutual love to let her follow him to prison to which i consented i myself accompanied him to greno but with a mournful heart none of us spoke a word on the sad journey i parted from them in deep distress the corpse was laid in a coffin and will be buried decently to-morrow in Veby churchyard to-morrow i must give a formal hearing to the witnesses god be merciful to me unfortunate man would that i had never obtained this position for which i fool that i am strove so hard as the venerable man of god was brought before me fettered hand and foot i felt as pilate must have felt as they brought christ before him it was to me as if my beloved god grant her comfort she lies ill in greno had whispered to me do nothing against that good man end of section 25 read by lars rolander